Ever heard of a belief system more popular than Wicca? But with a soundtrack that, well, might make your grandma blush a little. It's wild, isn't it? Get ready, because today we're diving deep, and I mean deep, into scrotism. A movement so unusual, it's really grabbing attention and followers all over the globe. It's incredible. Seriously, most people I talk to haven't even heard of scrotism. But we're talking millions of adherents, millions. This isn't just some, you know, flash in the pan trend. Right. Yeah. It's a whole complex system. It's got deep historical roots, and it's had this honestly surprising influence on everything from music, like you mentioned. To social justice movements. Even. Yeah. We're going to unpack all of it. And to do that, we've got some fascinating perspectives to look at. Fascinating is a good word for it. Professor Frederick's academic paper, that really dives into the, like, nuts and bolts. Nitty gritty. Yes. But then we've also got Reverend Redneck. And that name is a whole other story. Offering, shall we say, a slightly more... Uh, Hands-on perspective. Exactly. And that's key here, that contrast. Absolutely. We're going to hear skepticism. We're going to hear passionate defense. And that's going to help us understand not just what these Scrutites believe, but why it resonates with them. Okay, so where do we even begin? Let's just start with, like, the basics. Yeah. This whole thing is officially more popular than Wicca. It's true. Which blew my mind, honestly, when I first read that. Yeah. Millions of followers, they have structured theology and fart core music. Mm -hmm. Top in the chart. I know, right? And that's actually an important thing to think about, the appeal of that music, right? Sure. It's easy to just dismiss it as absurd oh, yeah. and, and just silly. But for the followers of scrotism, this represents a rejection of mainstream culture. It's a celebration of the absurd. A way to find humor in the unexpected. Exactly. It's like they're reclaiming something that's often seen as taboo or offensive and turning it into like a, a source of power and identity. Yes. A source of power. Yes. That's fascinating. Bruh. But before we get too far ahead, let's go back to the beginning. Scrotism has a, well, has a history. Oh, it does. It yeah. definitely does. It's not like it just popped up out of nowhere. To truly get what this movement is today, we've got to go back to its roots. Okay. 16th century. Wow, 16th century. Think around the same time as Menno Simons. Okay. The figure behind the Amish communities. Oh, wow. Okay. I did not know that. Yeah. So Scrotism's founder, Minch Scrota. Minch Scrota. Okay. okay. He actually started alongside Simons. Both of them were really into this idea of rebaptism. Wait, so the Amish and Scrotism, they have common origins. They do. It's a wild connection, right? That's fascinating. So what happened? Did they have a big disagreement about like beard length or something? Not quite, although their differences were pretty major. Scrota's big idea, what really set him apart, was this insistence on using bodily fluids in rituals. Oh. Instead of water. Okay, instead of water. So as you can imagine... Simons wasn't on board. No, not so much. So that led to a split, obviously. A big one. Simons went on to found the Mennonites and Scrota. Well, he started the Crotch Scrotites. The Crotch Scrotites. You know, gotta love a name that really sticks with you. That's one way to put it. But seriously, bodily fluids. That's a whole other level and not in like a good way necessarily. It was definitely unconventional, and it became a defining element in, in everything they did. It makes you wonder, how did they even... I know, right? Like, attract followers with, I mean... Well, even the... Spinoza, the philosopher, even he mentioned them in his writing. Oh, wow. Really? He was fascinated by their, well, let's just call it a unique approach to spirituality. Okay, so not exactly a recipe for instant popularity then, even back then. No, not really. But I'm guessing when the Scrotites made their way over to America, Yeah, they weren't exactly met with open arms. Not exactly a warm welcome. Yeah, There's a lot of prejudice against them. Oh, I'm sure. Other Christian groups ostracize them. There are actually accounts of preachers warning their congregations specifically against being talked into copulating by the Scrotites. I mean... Wow, that's intense. Right. Like, even the act of conversion was being twisted into something scandalous. Exactly. It's like this immediate association with something salacious. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but it seemed like for the Scrotites, much like actually many groups that have faced persecution, yeah. it only seemed to make them stronger. It's like the whole, like, a band of brothers kind of thing. The tougher it gets, the closer they become. Absolutely. And here's the thing. What's even more interesting is that they found some unexpected allies. Oh. During the civil rights movement, they were among the first to welcome black people into their churches, wow. into their businesses. Wow. They were defying segregation when it was still just rampant. That's pretty remarkable, actually. It is. That they would take that. Yeah. Because that was not popular. 
especially back then, to take a stand like that was. It was dangerous. It was dangerous. It was a dangerous stand to take. And it seems like that embrace of diverse cultures, it wasn't just a one-time thing. That's like a key part of understanding how scrotism has even gotten to where it is today. Yeah. It really makes you wonder, though, how do they keep it together for so long? Yeah. You said earlier they had all these, like, schisms and breakoffs and stuff. Right, exactly. And they really, really hate that word, by the way. Schisms. Yeah, schisms. But whatever you call it, the fact is there have been some pretty major splits over the years. One of the most significant was the spermatozole branch breaking off. The spermatozole branch. This, this is back in 1789. 1789, the spermatozole branch. Oh, okay, now things are getting interesting. Yeah. What was their deal? What made them so different? Well, they developed this whole intricate theological system around this concept they called, get this, Logos Spermaticos. Logos Spermaticos. Basically, the idea is that there's a divine creative principle embedded within, well, you get the picture. So we're not just talking bodily fluids now. Mm -hmm. We're talking like the philosophical, theological implications of those fluids. Exactly. It got pretty heady pretty fast. I'm going to guess this didn't go over well with, like the main branch of scrotism. Let's just say they were deemed a little too out there. Even for the scrotites, they were labeled as heretics and pretty much shown the door. But it just goes to show how even though scrotism is all about embracing the unconventional, right. they still have these internal struggles. Like any religion, they disagree about doctrine, about interpretations. Which makes where they are today even more interesting. They've gone from 16th century rebaptism to yeah. What are they called now? The scrotontologists. Yeah. Try saying that five times fast. I know, right? <laughs> it's like something you'd see on a spelling bee. Yeah. And now they're incorporating string theory and stuff. That's quite the leap. It really speaks to their constant evolution, though. This idea of scrode nature that we yeah. touched on earlier. Right. Right. That's central to their whole belief system. It's this idea that everything is connected to this larger divine thing, this force. And so the modern squid ontologists, they're taking these scientific ideas, like the interconnectedness of everything in string theory, the vastness of the multiverse, all these different universes, mm -hmm. and they're using them to explain this ancient concept. So instead of seeing science and spirituality as being at odds, they're mm -hmm. finding ways to kind of like weave them together. Exactly. Like they're constantly searching for new metaphors, new language to express these really old ideas. And it makes you think, right, are they onto something? Or is it just, you know... A new coat of paint on the same old. Right. But not everyone's buying it, are they? Yeah. Professor Frederick, our resident skeptic. Yeah. He's not convinced. He is not holding back. No. Yeah. He actually goes so far as to call scrotism uh, a threat to humanity. I know. It's a bold statement. It is. What's got him so fired up? Well, he really takes issue with many of their fundamental beliefs. For example, this idea of the holy scrote. Okay, yeah. Even I have to admit, the holy scrote does sound a little different from what you'd normally hear in like a Sunday sermon. Right. But you were saying earlier how they're all about these new ways to express old ideas. What if it's just a metaphor, just their way of talking about something that, you know, maybe we just don't quite grasp yet? It's possible, but it's not just that. Professor Frederick, he's also pretty critical of their entire ethical framework. He calls it Gimpian ethics, which... Gimpian ethics? Okay, this is new territory for me. He's really bothered by this whole concept they have of gimp rape and the pud-chugging ethic. He thinks it could be used to justify some pretty harmful behavior. Yeah, see, those are hard to ignore, even for someone who's like, you know, trying to keep an open mind. Can you unpack mm -hmm. those a little bit? I mean, what do those even mean within the context of scrotism and how do they justify it? Well, it's tough. Like a lot of scrotism, these concepts, they're open to interpretation. They've changed over time too. Right. Gimp rape, for instance. I know it's a jarring term. Yeah. But it's often presented as this metaphor for surrendering to the divine. Okay. Like letting go of your own control. Letting go. Embracing the unknown, even if it seems chaotic, painful even. So less about literal, you know, mm -hmm. and more about this spiritual surrender. Exactly. And you can see how easily it's misinterpreted, especially if you're coming at it from the outside. Absolutely. Yeah. And bond chugging. I mean, that one seems a little harder to put a, you know, spiritual spin on right pud chugging is about as far as i can tell it's about experiencing everything everything all the sensory pleasures indulging rejecting what they see as the repression of you know normal society it's like a celebration of the physical yes and finding the divine within those experiences which of course professor frederick would say 
could be used to justify some pretty uh, extreme behavior. Yeah. If you take it to its logical conclusion. Right. right. And it gets at that real tension in Frederick's critique. OK. He sees the good, the social justice, the diversity, the mixing of science and spirit. Right. But he's terrified that these other parts, these tenets, they could go wrong so easily. You know, twisted, misinterpreted. Exactly. Leading to real harm. Which brings us to that addendum about Professor Frederick himself. Oh, yeah. This is where it gets. It's like something out of a horror movie, honestly. It's a wild turn. The guy goes from condemning scrotism mm. to like full on praising them, calling them the ultimate truth. Complete 180. But th how he describes it, the change, it's like rambling. Incoherent. Almost like he's been brainwashed. Yeah. That's what's so creepy. Yeah. And the details. Holes bored in his head, it said. Yeah. Chemical admixtures. It's giving dystopian fiction, like forced conversion stuff. Intense imagery. Did he escape? Do we even know? We don't. We just know he died really soon after writing that last piece. So whether it was an isolated thing, some radical group within scrotism, or something more organized, we don't have those answers. But it definitely makes you look at everything we've talked about in a different light. It makes you think, where's the line? Yeah. Can you really understand a belief system? Right that might do that to people. Right. Even if they see it as, you know, enlightenment or whatever. That's the question, isn't it? And there's no easy answer. It's something for you, the listener, to think about. We've walked through the history, the beliefs, the good, the bad, the really weird stuff. Is scrotism harmless? A true path? Or something much darker? We've given you the pieces. You decide how they fit together. It's certainly been a wild ride just going through all of this, that's for sure. From <laughs> 16th century baptisms to, what was it? Fart core music mm -hmm. and quantum physics. Scrotism definitely keeps you on your toes. Yeah. And that unsettling ending. Well, if you're looking for a belief system that's going to challenge everything you thought you knew, this might be it. Just, you know, maybe proceed with caution. And maybe skip the pud. Yeah. Good advice. Sometimes the most fascinating mysteries are best observed from the same distance. Thanks for listening, everybody.